significant original contribution to knowledge. A keynote address by Tara Brabazon for the annual Enquire Conference 2023. I have a fondness for shoes, and irregular choice are my brand of both comfort and obviously fabulousness. But socks are the enemy of interesting shoes, and of course, forging long-term romantic relationships. But socks matter to a PhD and to research more generally, and today I want to talk about what the sock is and why the sock matters. So what exactly is a sock? Well, it's a significant original contribution to knowledge. It's the most important part of any PhD. Why? Well, the definition of a doctor of philosophy that makes it distinct and distinctive from a master's by research is an original contribution to knowledge. A doctorate offers originality to knowledge, and a master's synthesizes knowledge, both are valuable, by the way. But this originality issue is crucial because it is the defining characteristic of a PhD. But the SOC is a fascinating way of crystallising the doctoral project. Significant, original contribution to knowledge. In this keynote today, I'm going to take each of these words, significant, original, contribution and knowledge, and render them resonant for your work and for the PhD program more generally. And I'll finish off the session today showing you why the SOC can change not only your research, but your intellectual life. But I'm going to do the letters in a different order. I'm not doing it the S-O-C-K. In fact, I'm going to invert them. K-C-O-S. I'll start with the least controversial word and then move to the most controversial word in our sock. So let's move to our least controversial word, and that is knowledge. Knowledge is the theoretical and practical understanding of a subject. It can be obtained formally or informally, and the term implies understanding something, facts, ideas, or skills. More specifically, in philosophy, the study of knowledge is called epistemology. Knowledge is not true or simply true, but following on from Plato, knowledge is, quote, justified true belief, end of quote. So for Plato, there was a criteria for knowledge, justified, true, and believed. Now, just because we believe it doesn't mean that it's true or justified. And of course, that is what makes knowledge knowledge. While this seems a really bland description, I think the important part of that phrase from Plato is justified. Knowledge is not a vibe. (laughs) It's not a feeling. It's not an assumption. It is a justified belief. And it is believed, which means that an individual cannot create knowledge. Knowledge is shared, and most importantly, it is believed by others. So knowledge has an audience. Therefore, knowledge must be disseminated, it must be assessed, it must be evaluated, and yes, it must be believed. Knowledge is crucial to the scholarly life, but also what makes philosophy, philosophy, is the theory of knowledge that undergirds it. Our next word is the C word. (laughs) Yes, contribution. How does a PhD make a contribution to knowledge? Contribution is the role or part played by a person or object that enables the advancement of something, and that something could be the advancement of knowledge, for example. Contribution is also linked with importance. How have you intervened in your field and therefore list the possible policy implications or how practices may be changed in your discipline? A contribution can recontextualize a theory, a model or technique. It can expand an existing model. It can combine two or more ideas to create something completely new. Impact is big. 
but also ambiguous. It's the word of the moment, but it's the ambiguous word of the moment. But if we start to think about the impact of your research, and then that will enable you to articulate your contribution and contributions. Okay, we're at originality. A PhD must present, demonstrate and confirm how the research is original. I try and ensure that my students write one sentence in their thesis, and and they put that thesis in the abstract, in the introduction and the conclusion at least. And this sentence is, my original contribution to knowledge is (laughs) And this sentence is really important because the best doctoral research presents originality, but presents it in a succinct, focused and critical way. Originality in a doctorate is not demonstrated in a woolly or generalised way. We must be able to pinpoint with clarity what your original contribution to knowledge is. Originality is confirmed through having a strong and expansive grasp of the literature, verified through a literature review, integrated literature review or systematic review, and then research methods transparently presented create something new. And that shows us the scaffolding from existing knowledge to originality. The literature review and research methods confirm your accountability, transparency and repeatability in your research. The important part of this originality discussion is that the PhD must demonstrate the originality. It's not simply a matter of outlining the originality. You must demonstrate the originality. You must show how you reached originality and how your research has created something meaningful. So originality is more than something that is unique or something that is novel. Originality manifests in the doctorate through presenting new information for the first time, carrying out original research, generating or executing an original technique, observation or result, configuring an original idea or method or interpretation. Originality can emerge in the mode of testing someone else's ideas, empirical work that's not been done before, applying an old technique in a new area, that's always brilliant, and of course new evidence being applied to an old issue. The key challenge here is a PhD must not simply claim originality, it must demonstrate it in a clear way. Now there are many ways you can do this, but framing your work within the context of existing evidence, literature and methods is the most effective and efficient way. Also, really present with clarity the original contribution. I also love David Lodge's statement about originality, quote, deviating from the conventional, habituated way of representing reality, end of quote. Brilliant. The final word in SOC is the one that worries me. Here we go. Significant. While there are objective and verifiable strategies to demonstrate originality, a contribution and knowledge, significance is in the eye of the beholder. Students rightly worry about examiners being arbitrary in their judgments, picking out random or bizarre errors or flaws. The power held by examiners in a PhD is enormous. So students spend three years and the value of those three years is held in the hands of two examiners. So through policies and procedures and checklists, we try to frame and create normative parameters for examiners. But of course, examiners can go a bit rogue and do their own thing, do our own thing in assessment. So the original contribution to knowledge means that we as examiners are looking for your presentation of the literature and then a demonstration of how your methods have taken knowledge somewhere else to originality. All good, great, clear. But the word significant worries me. Don't get me wrong, it's brilliant if your thesis has made a significant contribution, but significance is very difficult to prove and to verify. And as I was moving through the literature for the SOC, for this keynote, 
I found four clear strategies for you to consider when you're trying to make the case for significance. One, the importance of your research question. So explain why the research was worth doing. Two, the significance of the findings. Why should the examiner care? Why do your findings matter? Three, explain how your research transformed theory. And four, explain the generalizability or lack of generalizability of your research. So we can break the significance bit down to recognize that you've made a contribution to research and that that contribution is worth making. Therefore, the research has value. You can hear in my voice the worry here. And just to add further worry to the word significant, it can also capture the importance or interest in your research by stakeholders. Yeah, so economic, social or cultural significance. Significance starts to play with impact and engagement, which of course are complex words in themselves. So significance can link with impact. Therefore, for many topics, they can simply be dismissed as unimportant because they're not contributing to the policy flavor of the day. The more challenging definitions, and we start to get into really shaky ground here, is when examiners have in their minds a particular parameter about the scope and the scale of a PhD. So a PhD must deploy the scope and scale of a data set or of particular reading. Significance, of course, is not about size. (laughs) A very small discovery can be incredibly significant, but it is about importance. And my worry is that importance can be subjective. All the other letters in SOC, originality, contribution, knowledge, can be demonstrated, confirmed, verified, and tethered to evidence. Significance is much more difficult to prove. It is much more in the gift and the subjectivity of the examiner. Significance, like importance, is defined by and from and through a particular perspective. All of us consider particular topics important and significant, and others less so. But that determination can be completely arbitrary, subjective, and political. All examiners, like all researchers, we have biases. We have favoured tropes and tech and methods and theories that claim significance in a particular direction. But for all of us, as students, as supervisors, we must be aware of the changing language and the changing landscape of doctoral education, from an original contribution to knowledge to a SOC, a significant original contribution to knowledge. So how I would handle this is, right from the start of your PhD program, have a significance file. So when you think something is important, you think it is significant, then you know what? Log it. It could be an innovation in method, a rare source that you were able to locate, a key connection with resonance for policy. But on the way through, just make sure you've got the pros. You've got the special paragraphs that make the case for significance. SOC is a fascinating intervention in international doctoral space. It's got challenges, it's got strengths, but I did want to finish off today with a few words about why the SOC matters and why your research matters and why you, as a researcher, you matter. This phrase that frames the SOC is the organic intellectual. This phrase is derived from Antonio Gramsci and his prison notebooks. Gramsci, of course, was imprisoned by the Benito Mussolini regime. The organic intellectual rejects the idea of the disinterested scholar. He critiques the traditional notion of the intellectual as a person who holds universal reason and general truths. Gramsci argues that such a traditional intellectual maintains the status quo and actually reinforces existing power structures and social inequalities. He argues that the unspoken purpose of such intellectual activity is, hang on to yourself, to reproduce injustice. Traditional intellectuals are pivotal. And why are they pivotal? Because they maintain homogeneity, consensus and rationality to block the consideration of hard alternatives. 
to be part of a university, to be a legitimate intellectual, we have to fulfil our role. And when you think about it, when we discuss a PhD's original contribution to knowledge, it emerges when we do a literature review, that is, we look at already existing knowledge, we use agreed on and tested methods, and extend knowledge just a little bit. But what if the literature was wrong? What if the wrong questions are being asked? What if you're simply providing the knowledge that the powerful, the funders, the grant agencies want you to discover? So much of traditional education is repetitive, cumulative, coordinating and controlling existing ideas to create common sense but the organic intellectual is different. It is an unstable identity. It is contingent. It is not a comfortable space. They move into spaces rarely considered to house knowledge. They live in between groups. The identity is relative, liminal, precious. Gramsci argues that so much of education, learning, involves repetition, accumulation and control of current and new ideas, teaching generation after generation. And of course, that teaches this repetitive, commonsensical knowledge. For Gramsci, education must be more. It must be disruptive. It must challenge the status quo. The role of the organic intellectual is not to insert newly legitimised knowledge into academic life or society, but to show clearly that the truths that we take for granted right now must be justified, explained, revealed, rather than assumed. The organic intellectual is a maker, is a communicator, intervening in practice and theory. The organic intellectual suspends common sense and reveals the provisional nature of the truths, the rules, the theories, the histories that we take for granted. I find this all quite inspiring, particularly now. Although we're living it, we have to realise that some truly weird, unfortunate, problematic and worrying contexts surround our universities. The organic intellectual crafts and indeed carves out a separate space, grinding out a location beyond common sense, beyond business as usual. The organic intellectual allows all of us who come from a place where educational success was not expected or assumed or even applauded to be remarkable, to craft that space for difference, not denying who we are, but using who we are, our truths, our injustices, our prejudices, our discriminations, to make a better knowledge, a tougher knowledge, a more rigorous knowledge, and yes, a more inclusive knowledge. So my presentation today simply finishes with you. You matter, your research matters, and the sock is simply one proxy for this mattering. But the skills that we're talking about today are beneficial to your research future. Situating yourself, situating your research in your field, in your discipline, keeps you contextually aware, keeps you honest, keeps you robust, but also compassionate and considerate. And I wanted to finish the keynote today with a speech from Theodore Roosevelt. And it's often referred to as the man in the arena speech. The speech itself was actually titled Citizenship in the Republic, delivered at the Sorbonne in Paris on April 23, 1910. This speech also has a pretty unfortunate history to it. Richard Nixon quoted it twice (laughs) in his victory and resignation speeches in 1968 and 1974, respectively. And Barack Obama cited some of the speech to endorse Hillary Clinton. Now, even with this difficult history, let's summon these words that are now more than a century old. Quote, It's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do good things. Deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself 
in a worthy cause, who at the best knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. End of quote. This speech always gets me going, but it's a reminder to recognise courage over comfort and that vulnerability is a strength of a different kind. Sock is the start of our research career, but it is courage and grit and vulnerability that will allow us to sustain it. <laughs>